Give Jesus a shout of praise. While you're standing, help me celebrate the pastor and the leader of this church, a tremendously surpassed God. What I do at our church every Sunday, I want you to help me feel at home. Y'all want me to feel at home, right? What do we do at our church is when I'm preaching, they say, preach on, pastor. Try that. Say, preach on, pastor. So you got to say that, you know, like all through the whole service. You got to say, preach on, pastor. We also pray, and every Sunday, we get each other's name, and we take a minute and pray for each other. I want you to look at the person next to you. I know you might not know their name. Get their name on both sides, on both sides of them, because they're going to pray for you for just a minute. Okay, now wait, hold on, hold on, hold on, what is, one second. If they look like they can't get a prayer through, just skip over them and go to the other person on the other side and get their name. Grab their hands and let's spend a moment in prayer. Go ahead, pray out loud together. You can be seated. I want to bring you greetings from the First Baptist Church in, in a place called Glenard, Maryland, just outside of Washington, D.C. I've been the pastor there for 28 years. I'm pastoring in the church I grew up in. I'm pastoring in the church where the Sunday school teachers used to tell me to sit down. Now I tell them, sit down. It feels real good to be able to tell them that. Even though they're already sitting down, it feels really good. You understand, it's a psychological thing. I bring you greetings from my wife, Trina Jenkins. For 38 years, we've been married. We have six kids. Lean over to your neighbor and say, Pastor, I like to do something other than preach all the time. We got six kids and three grandchildren. I wish I could tell you that I, I've been connected with her for 38 years because I've been to husbandbomb.com. 
I've been a jacked up joker. We're only together today because on one occasion she said, I'm sick and tired of this mess. She was just frustrated and she went into the closet, started packing her clothes. She said, I'm leaving. I can't take it. I'm sick and tired of this mess. I didn't know what to do, Pastor. I prayed and the Lord told me what to do and I did what he told me to do. I went in the closet behind her. I broke up my suitcase. I started packing my clothes. <laughs> I said, I'm sick and tired of this mess, too. I'm going with you. <laughs> You're not going to leave me here with these six kids by myself. <laughs> I want to talk to you tonight from the book of Jeremiah. I want you to turn if you have your Bibles, if they put it on the screen, Jeremiah chapter 12. I was told that this service right here was off the chain. Amen. Y'all have exceeded my expectations. From the moment I walked in this room, it has been electric. I'm proud of you. And I want to talk to you today. They said, this is the young adult crowd. This is the young adult crowd. And I want to talk to you today like a father talks to his kids. I want to talk to you. I'm, I'm almost 60. I know I don't look it. Go ahead and say, you don't look 60, Pastor. <laughs> I'm going to be 60 in a few months. But I want, to, I want to talk to you because you have the opportunity and the call upon your lives to change not just South Africa, but the world. Some of you are gonna, gonna, gonna be called and anointed by God to achieve and accomplish incredible things. You're gonna change the world, you are. The world can't keep going the way it's going, so God is raising up a new generation to do some new things. And you're gonna be a part of that. But I, I need to tell you some things to prepare you for that. That's what my assignment is. That's why I'm here, to tell you how to get prepared for it. Because there's some stuff you need to know before you get there. And the book of Jeremiah is going to help me do that. I've entitled this message, Running with the Horses. Look at your neighbor and say, you about to run with some horses, dude. I want to set the stage before I walk through these first five verses of Jeremiah 12. I want to tell you what's going on. I want to set the scene so that as we talk through this passage of scripture, you'll understand what's going on. The circumstance is this. The children of God have found themselves in a troubling situation. Here's what that trouble is. They have watched some of their relatives get freed from bondage, but they are some of them have remained in bondage. They have remained enslaved. And they're upset, they're mad, they're angry about it. They've watched other people get free while they remained in a troubling circumstance. Now the best way I know to relate that to you today is, is when you are single and you see your girlfriend who ain't living right get married. Everybody not happy about you getting married, baby. Everybody not celebrating. Some of them are jealous because they want that joker right there. <laughs> and they're upset. They're mad because they have remained in bondage and they saw some other people get free and they're upset about it. Some of you today have watched people get promoted. You've seen people move forward and do things that you wish you could do and God didn't afford the time and the opportunity for you. And if you were to be honest, you are pissed off about it. Can I say pissed off about it? Is that, will y'all be upset about that? Is it it's too late? Y'all do know pisseth is in the Bible, in the, new, in the King James Version, it is. Look it, in the, look it up in the concordance, it's there. They're angry. And so they go to, their, to the prophet, their pastor, Jeremiah. And they talk to Jeremiah, and they complain to Jeremiah, and they tell him how upset they are, and then 
They asked Jeremiah, can he talk to God for them? And so in these first four verses, Jeremiah talks to God on their behalf. Let's take a look at what he says to God. Verse 1. I'm reading from the New King James translation. Jeremiah chapter 12, verse 1 says, Righteous are you, O Lord, when I plead with you, yet let me talk with you about your judgments. Y'all missed a great spot. Let me, let me break that down for y'all. Here's what he's saying. He's saying, Lord, you normally make some great decisions, but I want to talk to you about some of these latest decisions you've been making. Why does the way of the wicked prosper? Why are those happy who deal so treacherously? Why is the way of the wicked prosper? Why do the people who live the raggediest seem to do so well? Why is it that here I am pressing my way to go to church on Sunday? Amen. Pressing my way to worship God, hoping my hoopty going to get me there. And my neighbor next door got a brand new car and ain't thinking about going to church. Look straight ahead, nobody know I'm talking about you. I see y'all acting like y'all don't know what I'm talking about. Why do the people who live so wickedly prosper? Why do they get the promotions on the jobs? Why do they get the new cars? Why do they seem to be doing so well? Why are, they, why are the people who are living the raggediest doing the best? Then he says to them, why are those happy who deal so treacherously? Why are the people who are the nastiest people? Why do they seem to be so happy? They're mean, they're nasty, they don't speak to people. And so Jeremiah is talking to God. And then in verse 2, look at verse 2, right here, verse 2. He says, you have planted them, yes, and they've taken root. They grow, yes, they bear fruit. You are near in their mouth, but far from their mind. Ooh, y'all got that. Did y'all get that right there? Here's what he's saying, Lord. Jeremiah is saying, Lord, they, they, are, they are where they are because of you. You planted them. You bless them. Let me tell you something. Anytime anybody has any level of success in life or prosperity in life or victory in life, it's not because they got there by themselves. God opened the door for them to get there. Whether you go to church, whether you're saved, whether you follow Jesus, it don't matter. If you got any level of success in life, God opened up the door for it to happen. It's a shame you've waited so long to give him the praise and the glory and the thanks to enable you to be where you are. He planted you. He opened the door. He gave you what you got. He blessed you. He fed you. He put a roof over your head. He performed a miracle for you. Matter of fact, he says, he says, that you are near in their mouth but far from their mind, far from their heart. Listen to what he's saying. He's saying, Lord, they know how, they, they know how to talk the talk. But the problem is their minds and hearts are far from you. Y'all missed it. Y'all missed a great spot to shout amen. Because y'all know y'all met people who know how to talk the church lingo and talk like they know the Lord, but the reality is they really don't care about them. When you ask them how they're doing, they say, they know the church lingo, they say what? Blessed, y'all got it, blessed and highly favored. They say I'm blessed. They know, the, they know the talk of the church, but as soon as they leave the campus, they go back to being mean and nasty. And then in verse 3, are y'all still with me? Verse 3, he says, but you know me, but oh Lord, you know me, you've seen me. You have tested my heart towards you. Oh, look at that. Here's what he's saying. Hey, I'm your boy. I'm your dog. <laughs> you know me. You saw me search for you. You see me in church every Sunday. You see me paying my tithes. You see me paying my offering. You see me leaping and jumping and shouting and worshiping. And why are the people who not even going to church doing so well? You've seen me. And then they make 
He makes a suggestion to God. He says, pull them out like sheep for the slaughter and prepare them for the day of slaughter. Y'all missed it. Y'all keep missing the, the spots that He's making a suggestion to God. He's saying to the Lord, let me, let me sum it up for you. Kill them. <laughs> Take them out. You see, the problem with the statement is he, he, has, he has concluded, as many of you have concluded, that somehow the blessing that was intended for you has somehow wound up at their doorstep. They've concluded that that, that, that miracle should have, been, should have been, been at their house. That new car should have been there. That, this wedding should be them marrying Marcus. The problem with that theology and that thinking, the problem with this word is, listen, brothers and sisters, you never ought to be jealous of what God does for somebody else. God never delivers your mail to somebody else's house. As a matter of fact, you ought to give God the praise when he blesses your neighbor because it means he's in the neighborhood. And if he's in the neighborhood, you might be next. If he's in the neighborhood, your door, your blessing might be coming down the pike. If he's in the neighborhood, he might be at your house next. Woo. I like this crowd. When we get to verse 4, they have another twisted theology here. It says, how long will the land mourn and the herbs of every field wither? The beasts and birds are consumed for the wickedness of those there who dwell there. Let me break that down for you because here's what they're suggesting to God. They're suggesting this to God now. They're talking, he's talking to God. He says, the land is mourning, the herbs of the field are withering, the beasts and the birds are consumed. Why? Because of the wickedness of the people who dwell there. Now here's the problem. I don't know if y'all had this problem in South Africa, but in America we got this big problem. Pastor, we got this big problem that the churches have concluded, the teachers in our communities have concluded that when the, the land is not doing well, when the land is mourning, when the beasts are dying, when prosperity is not happening, they've concluded it's happening because of wickedness, because of how sinful the people are living. I want to beg to differ with us on this point. They have concluded that that's why the land is hurting. Let me tell you something. God, let me straighten out some theology. God never judges a nation because of the wickedness of wicked people. Y'all see how the claps got a little bit low on that point right there? Because you concluded that, that, that God blesses a nation or judges a nation because of wicked people. And let's be clear. Wicked people can't live holy. Without Jesus in your life, you can't stop sinning. You can't change your life. You can't break habits. You can't be free. Without Jesus, you need the Lord Jesus in your life to free you from whatever habits, whatever issues, whatever challenges, whatever problems you have. The only way you can be free, the only way out of your problems is a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. God does not judge a nation because of the wickedness of wicked people. God judges a nation when the people who go to church are not doing right. That's what causes God to judge a nation. <laughs> Pastor, where do you get that? Where do you conclude that? Because the Bible says just judgment begins at the house of God. God starts judging a nation because the ushers are messing around with each other. They shouldn't be messing around. And the choir and, and the praise and worship and the band and the people who say they love the Lord are doing the stuff they ain't supposed to be doing. Go on and preach, Pastor Jenkins. That's what y'all supposed to say. Preach on. <laughs> it's
it's when the so-called saints don't do right. It's when the people who say they love God make the wrong choices and live raggedy lives and make the wrong behavior. That's when God judges a nation. So he says all of this to God. And by the time we get to verse 5, are y'all still with me? By the time we get to verse 5, God is tired of Jeremiah's talking. And in verse 5, God starts talking. And when God starts talking, he asks a question. He starts asking a question. Can I tell you something? When God asks a question, it's not because he doesn't know the answer. Here's what God says. If you have run with the footmen and they have wearied you, then how can you contend with horses? Oh, that, he, God says, here's what, he, he, look, several things. Number one, God is saying to them, y'all are complaining about issues, and God calls their issues footmen problems. Well, what does that mean? Why is he calling them footmen problems? He calls them footmen problems because back in that day, when they had wars, and when one nation attacked another nation, and one people went after conquering another people, the strategy was to send in thousands of footmen soldiers. What's a footman soldier? They're not the fastest. They're not the smartest. They're not the strongest. They're not the best equipped. They're not the, they're not the best, but it's just a whole lot of them. Let me say it. Let me give it to you again. They're not the fastest, not the smartest, not the strongest, not the best equipped. Probably just like this section right here. Or is it right here? Maybe it's like this section. No, it's not that one. They're not the best soldiers, but they send in thousands of them, and their lone assignment is to come in and weaken the, uh, the, the nation that they are attacking. That's their job, just to come in. They're not going to win. They're not going to take over the city. They're not going to be victorious, but they're just going to weaken it. They just sent in hundreds and hundreds of these foot soldiers that weaken the company or the nation that they're attacking. God says to you that the problems that you're facing, that you're complaining about, and here's what you need to know as you go through life, that the issues that you're going to face, you're going to have days and seasons of issue after issue and problem after problem and trouble after trouble and issue after issue, and instead of crying, and complaining about it, God said, these are footmen soldiers. He said, I don't want you to get frustrated and bent out of shape and walk out and quit because of footmen soldiers. I know you're mad and upset because you've been overlooked and misunderstood and can't find a wife and can't get a job and you got all kinds of issues. These are just footmen problems. I know you're upset and mad that uh, people have not treated you the way, don't recognize how gifted you are, how anointed you are. These are footmen problems. But somebody said, somebody said, well, Pastor Jenkins, why should I be so excited about footmen issues? Because footmen are indications that you're headed in the right direction. There y'all go getting quiet again. I don't know why y'all, sh you shouldn't be quiet on that. Because, listen, I know you're frustrated because you got all these issues and problems. and It's problem and issue and problem and challenges and all this stuff facing you. And I know you're upset about it. But my job is to tell you, instead of complaining and crying, tell yourself, I ain't going to quit. I haven't walked away. I haven't cussed nobody out. I haven't given nobody a piece of my mind. You have to say, I'm still here. I'm still in church. I'm still worshiping God. I'm still giving him praise. I'm still giving him a dance. I didn't let these issues run me away. Somebody high-five your neighbor. Say, I'm still here. 
still in the midst. I'm still worshiping God. Oh, yeah, I done had all kinds of issues come and all kinds of problems come down the pike. I should have quit. I should have given somebody a piece of my mind. I should have cut somebody out. I should have had a nervous breakdown. But I'm still here. Somebody say, I'm still here in the midst of tears running down my face, in the midst of not knowing what tomorrow holds. I am still here. not going to get weary. The devil sees you. Here's what I discovered. When you get close to a life-altering accomplishment, the devil sees you getting close to a significant transition point in your life. He starts sending in the foot soldiers. Foot soldiers are indication that you're headed in the right direction. I'm going to lean over and tell your neighbor, I must be headed in the right direction. All this hell I'm going through, all these challenges I'm having, all the stuff people saying about me, all the stuff I haven't understood, I know why it is. The devil's trying to get me to quit and stop and walk away, but I'm not going to quit. I must be headed in the right direction. Now, God calls them foot soldiers, and it means I'm headed in the right direction, but they are also precursors to horses. I didn't think y'all would shout on that. Because after the foot soldiers come soldiers on horses. They're the smarter ones, stronger, better equipped, on horses. I think that's these people over here. <laughs> God says in verse 5, if the footmen have worn you out, what are you going to do when the horses come. Here's what I discovered. Somebody said, why should I be excited that it's only going to get worse? <laughs> Here's why I discovered the bigger the trial. When I get on the other side of the trial, the bigger the victory. Somebody ought to help me shout and tell God I got a huge victory on the other side. I got a big victory on the other side. All the stuff that's causing me to cry and get worried and frustrated, I must got a big blessing on the other side. High five somebody say, I must got me a huge blessing on the other side. The text says, if you have run with the footmen and they have wearied you, then how can you contend with horses? Here who has blown my mind. The mere fact that God says, how can you contend with horses if the footmen are wearing you out, indicates that God has an expectation of you to contend with the horses. And the problem is, a man can't contend with a horse. Horses are strong. They, they rest while they're standing. That's true. They run in the heat and the cold. They can run over long distances. 
And God says, how are you going to contend when the horses come? Well, a man can't contend with a horse. If I put a man up against a horse, the horse is going to win every time. Amen. What is God saying? He's saying this, and I'm going home. <laughs> I don't want to go home. I want to stay here with y'all. Y'all so happy. God is saying he has an expectation for you to contend with horses. That's what the whole text means. He, his, his expectation is for you to contend with horses. But I feel the tension in the room. You saying, how can a man contend with a horse? In the natural, you can't. But when you have supernatural power, when you got the Holy Ghost on your side, he gives you power to do supernaturally what you can't do in your own power. I don't know who I'm preaching to today, but I'm coming to tell you that God is about to take you some places that you didn't dream, you didn't anticipate, you never expected. God is about to do something fabulous in your life. You're not getting there by your education, by your good looks. You're getting there only because of the power and the presence of a holy God. I pastor, pastor, I, I, I pastor the First Baptist Church of Glenarden. It's one of the largest African American churches in America. I don't have a college degree. I just did get out of high school. <laughs> and I didn't graduate magnum cum laude, cum laude, sigma cum laude. I did graduate, thank you, Lordy. I did graduate like that. <laughs> Do I got any thank you, Lordies up in here? didn't graduate from college. I don't have a seminary training. And I'm pastoring one of the largest churches in, in the United States, African American church. I'm running with the horses. Y'all ain't hearing what I'm telling you. I'm not supposed to be there. I'm not qualified to have the job. I'm not supposed to have been called there. But I am running with the horses. I sit on bank boards, hospital boards, Listen, I, I sit on boards to clear doctors to function in hospitals. I sit on bank boards and approve people to get loans. I've preached to three presidents. I've preached to governors around the country. Uh, I've, I've traveled the world. I'm doing things. I'm here preaching at CRC tonight. I'm not supposed to be there. And I'm here to tell you, God is about to take you some places that you are not supposed to be there. But I'm telling you, get ready to run with the horses. I don't know who I'm preaching to.
by you. You're going to have job opportunities come that you don't feel qualified for. It's okay. God's opening up the door for you. The most important thing for you, wherever you go in life, is that you walk in there with Jesus right by your side. Because with him, you can run through troops and leap over walls. With him, you can accomplish the supernatural things. Now, there's somebody here tonight, several of you, Jesus is not walking with you. You haven't made a decision to choose him. Come here. Come, just get out of your seat and say, you know what, I want to I wanna get right with Jesus. Just gather your stuff and just come on down here right now and say, you know what, I want to get right with Jesus. This the time. Come. This the moment. Don't be afraid. Don't be ashamed. You need him. Come. Arms, you need him. Come. 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 Come